welcome, welcome, one and all. I am Dr. David Litwa, and I want to welcome everybody to the next live session here. It's a beautiful Sunday afternoon in Boston. Welcome, welcome, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me. Please let me know if you can't. Um, and yes, so we've got a few people in the chat. Um, just give me a thumbs up or a like if you can hear me okay. Just testing the mic here. Uh, if there's any problems, let me know. I want to welcome everybody here for uh, the next session. And this is very special for me because it is the celebration of the publication of my book, Simon of Samaria. I am, unfortunately, I, I, they haven't sent me a copy. Uh, so I was told by uh, Stephen Eastman in the UK that actually the Kindle version has been available for over a month now. And so you can pick that up. But uh, even I, I, I don't have the physical book. So, But when I do get the physical book, which I've ordered, okay, um, I'm going to put a deal on Patreon for those who want to purchase it. And actually, already on Patreon, there's a 35% off discount flyer. So go check that out. Uh, that, you know, is worth the price of your subscription, <laughs> probably for a couple months anyway. Um, so go check that out. I've also been updating my website. I took the, the plunge this week and just got my own domain. So I am no longer... Um, I no longer am at wordpress.com. I am at mdavidlitwa.com. And I've already, I'm going to put that in the chat here. I have already put up a bunch of posts, I think four or five posts. And this is the beginning of hopefully what will be a very, very successful blog. I'm very, very excited about it. Um, I think I have a fair bit to contribute. I, I think I have a lot to contribute, actually. And, you know, it, it's it's one of those ways that I can produce or I can contribute in another way over and above Patreon. Patreon is great, but it takes about a third of what uh, you guys give me if you do decide to support me. And so I'm, I'm working toward basically freeing myself. The goal is to free myself and get back to my family, as some of you know, there. My wife, uh, you know, I've been waiting for two and a half years for the U.S. government to grant my wife a visa. There's nothing wrong with her. She was just born in the Middle East. So, um, but my goal is to live with them and to break out of this system, uh, this academic system where I'm needing to, you know, gather a paycheck every week. So, Every dollar, every uh, everything that you contribute goes toward achieving that goal. Once I can pay rent, I can move on, move back to my family, and uh, hopefully at some point, once things become consistent, I can kiss my day job goodbye. So that's the goal, okay? That's what I'm aiming for. It's a very concrete goal. Uh, I just want to be self-supporting. And that is part of the reason why I'm here. Part of the reason is that I'm growing this channel, and I hit another milestone this week, which I have all of you to thank, and that is the 7K subscribers milestone. Really appreciate that. I appreciate everybody who shared. I appreciate everybody who has mentioned my videos or who has told a friend about them or told family about them. Obviously, there's a lot out there, and there's a lot that's sucking up your attention, and I totally know it. Believe me, I know it. Um, and what I'm all that I'm trying to do is to produce good, solid content, exactly the same quality of what I would produce in any kind of course that I would teach in a brick-and-mortar university. Ultimately, the goal is to get in line with our modern market economy and to become myself a university. Okay. So internet is a great thing. Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of an annoying thing because it's, you know, <laughs> you can get sucked down so many rabbit holes, but in the end, it's a great thing because it's going to enable me through online teaching and hopefully you in some way to gain the financial freedom that you need to pursue your dreams. So that's, that's what we're 
what I'm aiming for anyway. So that's why I'm here. And I don't want to dumb it down. I, I, and I, I refuse to dumb it down. Uh, I want to be offering the exact same quality of education that I would in any kind of top-notch Ivy League uh, setting. And uh, so, you know, the courses that I publish, the weekly videos that I publish, the stuff that I put on Patreon, the stuff that I'm now, you know, loading to my blog, all this stuff is to keep people informed at the highest possible level, okay? Obviously, I'm not assuming everybody knows Latin or Greek or Coptic or Hebrew or anything like that, but that's the point. A lot of the stuff that happens in New Testament studies and in, and in early church history and patristics, all that stuff happens in German and French and Italian. You know, this morning I was uh, reading this article by Enrico Norelli, who can't seem to write an article less than about 50 pages, and it's all in Italian, but it's absolutely necessary for me to read this because it's on Marcion. And this brings me to the next topic, which is the Marcion book. I am working on it, folks, and, and, and I'm excited, and I'm very excited to be working on this, but I need your support to do that, right? Because let's face it, who has time these days to write a book? I mean, let's <laughs> we barely have enough time to cook dinner, uh, so how am I going to find time to, to, to write a book? Well, the only way that I can do that, the only way that I can give that gift to the world, so to speak, is through your support whether through Patreon or the blog or a donation, you are helping Marcion be born. I want to be clear about my goals with the Marcion book as well. I want to definitely and concretely replace Ada von Harnack's book on Marcion. That book has reigned for 100 years, okay? He published that book in 1921 with an update in 1924. It is now 100 years exactly since we got that definitive edition of Marcion, which, and you know, the fact is, even today, a lot of the stuff you read about Marcion on the internet or in encyclopedia articles, all of that is simply regurgitated Harnack. Now, there's been enough articles and there's been enough uh, studies out there to not only produce dents in the Harnackian paradigm, but really to collapse it. And so, what I want to do is write the study that will last for the next 100 years. I want your grandchildren in the year 2124 to be making videos and saying to your great, great grandchildren, the Litwood paradigm that has reigned supreme for 100 years and it's time to get rid of that tired old paradigm. That's what I want. I want 100 years of value, 100 years of transformed study of Marcion that I can help produce. And to do that, I need your help, okay? I don't want to write a newspaper article. I don't want to write another journal article. I want to write a book that lasts. And uh, I have to thank you know, one of my greatest supporters here, Stephen Eastman. Thank you so much already. <laughs> I was given this wonderful super chat. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, you've been with me for so long, and I really appreciate that. And uh, I hope, I hope that I am able in some way to gift back to you just a bit of what you've given to me. But let's go to let's go to you first. So, Simon of Samaria and the Simonians, fantastic book. Really appreciate that. I think Stephen, you know, you might have been the first to get it. I, <laughs> um, and um, do you think there's anything to David Trobish's hypothesis that Mark was created to pose as a source for the prototype gospel? Well, I think, you know, we discussed some of this a bit last week. And uh, I, I think, well, let me say, first of all, as, as I said last week, too, that the Trobish's book, which is the, the very recent one, I think published just last year, um, I think it's on the origin of the New Testament. It's, just, it's something that really I highly recommend. I've got a review on, on, on the Patreon. Really, really interesting, fascinating book. Um, and so it, it's really about what he calls the end redaction or the, the, that canonical edition that he thinks is put out in the mid 
second century. Okay, and and that there's a kind of I don't think he uses the term genius, but there's a there's a kind of very sophisticated editor at work and an editing maybe a, a person maybe a team who put together our New Testament and they had very consistent ways of doing it right so they had a system of abbreviations and they had a system where they organized exactly which gospels were going to be there and they had a system where they organized the Pauline material and it's all very conscious product and they they made the titles uniform like you know according to Matthew according to Mark so on and so forth and that's all part of this final canonical edition. And it's a fantastic, fantastic, thought-provoking book, even if you don't buy it all. It's really, really good. So Mark created to pose as a source for the prototype gospel. I think that's an interesting question. I, uh, you know, as I recall, I'm not sure that Trobisch comes down hard anywhere where he wants to have a, have a kind of a strong hypothesis about which gospel is first. If I'm wrong, just come back in the chat, uh, Stephen, um, or anyone. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's really a huge question right now, who really is first and who's serving as the fundamental source for who, for, for who? You know, in the ancient church, it used to be everybody thought that that was Matthew and that Mark was an abbreviation. And that hypothesis is still active. It's just that very few people hold it. Well, now we've got the prototype gospel, and or what I'm calling the prototype gospel, which is Marcion's, uh, the, the text that Marcion uses in Pontus, and the text that I think both Marcion and the author of Canonical Luke are using independently, uh, and to, pr to produce essentially a text that they consider to be authoritative, okay? So was this prototype gospel earlier than Mark? Well, I'm releasing a video this week on Patreon that kind of hopefully should put a little bit of an interesting take on this. And it's, it has to do in part with answering the question of what is the abomination of desolation and how early can that be? I know there's a lot of theories about the abomination of desolation, but it, it's, something that, it's something that the prototype gospel and canonical Luke don't have. So it's, it's something that Mark distinctively has. It's one of those rare things that Mark distinctively has that, that Matthew takes over, but that Luke and Proto-Luke or whatever you want to call it, the prototypical gospel, they, that does not take it over, okay? And I think, I mean, my personal theory, which, which I've said, you know, in the past, but I'm, I'm developing in this video called Pagan Jerusalem, is that the abomination of desolation has to refer to something very concrete, it has to be something like what happened in the age of Antiochus Epiphanes, if you remember in, in the Maccabean literature, where there's there's a very concrete thing that Antiochus Epiphanes does to bring about the abomination of desolation, and that's to set up his own statue to make the cult site of Yahweh a cult site for the the ruler, in this case, the Hellenistic ruler, okay? And that actually, you know, Antiochus was never really able to pull that off. The, the people who pulled that off were actually the Romans when after the Bar Kokhba revolt. And we know, we know for a fact that Hadrian put at least one, if not two statues on the Temple Mount. And he probably although it's not absolutely certain, he probably put an entire temple to Zeus there, thinking that, you know, that, that represented the local Zeus of the Judeans, otherwise known as Yahweh or Yahweh. Now, that definitely would have been an abomination of desolation, but that, that could only be in the year 135, okay? That's the really, I mean, possibly a bit, possibly a bit earlier than that. We don't know what was going on during the Bar Kokhba War, but... Realistically, that's a development that occurred in 135. So if Mark is referring to that, and if Matthew is referring to that, then the, the additions of Mark and Matthew that we have have to be after 135, okay? So, you know, I, I mean, the other thing to be, remind yourselves of is, is everything between, 
you know, when we think of publishing a book, we think of publishing something that's very discreet, that's very, uh, uh, shall we say, you know, the final form that cannot be changed. That form of publication just didn't exist in antiquity because there was no printing press, right? There's no printing press and there's no, there's not even a Xerox machine. So every time you copy something, you're going to introduce small changes intentionally or unintentionally. So when we talk about the publication of the Gospels, we're always talking about a kind of a fluid product. And until you get to what David Trobisch refers to as, an, as a concrete addition that, you know, is sacred and seen as inspired, then, you know, the, the, you, you get something which, at least it, theoretically, people shouldn't be changing. And in fact, they still did change it. But the period between 100 and 150 is especially fluid. So, you know, what, when we refer to, you know, the gospel according to Mark or Matthew or Luke, they weren't even called that. Even if you think that, you know, they, they existed, they weren't called that, first of all. But they were, second, second of all, the most important point is they weren't stable texts, right? They were eminently revisable, and we can tell this because of certain additions, like the the woman caught in adultery in John 8 added in, right? I mean, this is in, in the manuscripts. We can see this even in later manuscripts that some have it, some don't, right? The longer ending of Mark, Mark actually has two endings. Well, actually, it has three different endings, uh, depending on which manuscript that you're, that you're reading. And they're all added later than the original ending, which was probably in 168 which some people think is a great ending. You know, it's the women running from the tomb, but some people think is a terrible ending. And apparently whoever is adding endings in the second century <laughs> is trying to improve. <laughs> and so all these things are fluid. And really we don't have any idea prior to about 200 of what's changed and what's not changed. So even if my theory about the abomination of desolation is right, it's not necessarily an argument that, you know, the gospel of Mark was written in 135 it was probably revised after 135. But then again, all the Gospels were probably revised after 135 until we get to something like the Tetraform Gospel, which is what Irenaeus has on his library shelf, where he's got all four, all four, and they start putting them into a single codex, okay? So, you know, in antiquity, Basically, you know, they, they didn't have a codex that would fit everything, right? I mean, the, like our, you know, 2,000-page Bibles, that, that would never work in antiquity. They could put together maybe, you know, 300 pages. So they could put the four Gospels together. They could put the, the Pauline letters together. Um, and really, it's, it's not until they start getting really wealthy uh, into the 4th century where they can put, you know, huge codex, codexes or codices together. Um, but in the early period, yeah, they, they're just the, probably the best that they could do, you know, with the kind of mid-grade technology and, the, you know, the money that they had was to put the four Gospels together. And that's what they started doing. And that's, you know, the big sign, the, the physical evidence that they were thinking in terms of a tetraform Gospel, which is what what Irenaeus talks about. So anyway, hop on Patreon, go see my review of Trovish, get get his book. You know, we, we can further discuss it. If, if, if a lot of people are interested, just let me know. Happy to do that. Thank you again, Stephen. If I haven't fully gotten to what you're what you were after, please let me know in the chat. Endless Mike, uh, thank you so much for your super chat. Really appreciate it. Uh, it's great to have you, and uh, thank you for what you do. Thank you. Uh, what do you think of the reception, or, or what do you think the reception of Paul's letters was before Marcion? Were they widely considered scripture? What references do we have in pre-Marcion authors? Fantastic question. In fact, this this particular topic is pretty well researched. There's a there's a pretty recent book by Eric Shabenska called Canonizing Paul. And it's a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty good book. I think it's 2013. And he goes through, we also have Harry Gamble. Harry Gamble is actually my advisor, my, my doctor of honor. Uh, and he wrote a book in, in, in the 1990s called Books and Readers. And he, he's got a section in there on, on the Pauline collections, which is really, really good as well. So 
what seems to have happened is, yeah, I, I think there's there's fairly good substantiation and evidence that the Pauline collection existed before Marcion. So Marcion is adapting, just like I think he does with his gospel, he's adapting a, a pre-existing Pauline collection. He's not writing Paul's letters, okay? Just like he's not writing the gospel, okay? He is, isn't collecting them. You know, you know you'll hear sometimes, uh, even the modern Marcionite church, which I have a post about this, um, they, they think that Marcion, you know, went from city to city to city where Paul had written a letter to, and that he himself did the collecting, that he himself was the collector of, of the Pauline letters. And that uh, doesn't seem to be the case because there were already collections. So Marcion, being an extremely well-traveled man, would have come across collections of the letters by the time he was an adult in, in, in his 20s or 30s. So he didn't need to do that work himself. And that these early collections, so he, these early collections were probably seven letter or not, well, I, I have to correct myself. They were seven churches. They were written to seven churches, but they were 10 letter collections, or at least the collection that Marcion used was a 10 letter collection, but written to seven churches. And the reason why this is important is, is seven is the number of universality, so if you write to seven churches, you are writing to the universal, universal church. Now, this is the first thing that they'll tell you in, in, in undergraduate or graduate school that actually is not the case with Paul. He's, he's not writing universal letters. <laughs> he's writing to very specific communities. And Paul himself, when he's alive, has absolutely no idea that his letters will be collected and canonized, okay? Um, I mean, if he did, he would definitely want to collect the royalties. But no, he had no idea... Um, that he would become a bestseller. He had no idea that, you know, now in Augusta, Georgia, or, you know, um, Durham, UK, or uh, Calcutta, India, you know, people would be reading his letters. <laughs> um, he thought the world was going to end, you know, <laughs> before he died. So, <laughs> um, so, but that's what they did. And, and how they did that, we don't really know. Maybe Paul kept an extra copy. So some people have suggested that he kept an extra copy of his letters, which isn't a crazy idea. That is something that, that Cicero and, and other letter writers would do. Obviously, when you look at the letter writers of Seneca, the, the letters of Seneca, the, this is kind of a you know high literary register kind of letters. But, um, and we don't know if he is actually sending them, but that's the other trick. We don't, don't actually know that. But he's definitely, you know, keeping a copy by himself. You know, authors keep copies of their works in, the, in antiquity for the obvious reason that, you know, they want to control the amount of corruption that is inevitable when their works go, I won't say go viral, but when they go public, um, they need to keep a record. So it seems like, People, certainly by the late first century, respected Paul enough to collect his letters. We don't know exactly how they did that, but we do know that they wanted to make Paul into a kind of universal apostle, an apostle to the Gentiles, an apostle to the nations. And so they they had it, they, they collected the letters in such a way so that it only got to seven churches. Now there might have been more, that's the crazy thing. I mean, there might have been more, but they were fixated on the seven churches idea. And so we've got 10, 10 letters. And later on uh, in, the, in the Catholic, early Catholic editions, they added three more, Titus, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and uh, Hebrews. So, um, that, you know, I mean, nobody thinks that that's by Paul anymore, but they did in, in antiquity. So there was a 14 letter collection. And, and you know, even in the manuscripts of, of the, the, the third century, there's a lot of fluctuation, some, some, some manuscripts have the pastorals. Some, some manuscripts don't have the pastorals. Uh, Hebrews is especially volatile. You know, they, they stick it in in weird places. You know, it's never consistent where they, they stick that in. So that's something to keep in mind. Absolutely. It's, it's something that is really, really interesting uh, as you look at the Pauline letter collection. And I think, you know, in Marcin's Marcin, contribution there is not that he invents the collection, but that he he canonizes his particular collection and he forces the other assemblies, the other ecclesial networks, he forces them essentially to say, you know, are you going to put Paul in your canon or not? 
<laughs> and they do, but the way that they tame Marcion's Paul is, is not by removing bits and pieces of Paul, it's by adding forged Pauline letters so that the, the overall recipe of Paul is changed so that he ends up being uh, a lot more kind of, for lack of a better term, Judaizing. Um, okay, so uh, I hope that that gets a little bit into your question. I um, appreciate, again, your, your, your super chat. Um, and endless Mike, really appreciate that. And Stephen, you're back. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate that um, uh, with your super chat. Is there any indication who Marcion thought the author of the prototype gospel was? Is there any mention of the prototype gospel before Marcion ad adopted it? And do you think the prototype used, used any earlier gospels? Okay, now we're getting into the meat of this, right? <laughs> okay. Well, it's interesting that, you know, Marcion never said who the prototype gospel was, you know, who, who wrote the prototype gospel. Interestingly, okay, in the Adamantius dialogue, the Adamantius dialogue is, is early fourth century dialogue where two Marcionites are speaking to a Catholic in a debate, okay? And the Catholic is called Adamantius, all right? And they make the assertion that the author of their gospel it, it, it's basically, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the answer that 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 I, you could call the Sunday school answer. Uh, on on the, the the author is God, right? So I mean, this is what what you know any any kind of really kind of fundamentalist or dogmatic Christian would say about I think any of the Bible. You know, the author is God. Okay, but then when you press them and and they're pressed in the Adamantius dialogue, you know, who's the human author? <laughs> well, and then they say Paul. Uh, or sorry, then they say Christ, okay? <laughs> and this is a little bit funny because then you get into the same issue where, you know, even though today Jesus isn't viewed as a writer, you know, there there are these letters to Abgar that Jesus supposedly wrote in, in Eusebius U. So the idea of Jesus being a writer, it's not necessarily a radical idea in antiquity. You know, I, I had someone, you know, when I was in div school, they'd write me a note and say that I've got actual words of Jesus that he wrote down. And um, and I was like, oh, well, that's cool. Why don't you show me? And he, and he, he showed me the letters of Abgar, <laughs> which is in Eusebius. <laughs> and I said, that's not going to work well. But anyway, the, the, this whole issue of Jesus writing something then raises the question, well, if, if Jesus wrote the gospel, I mean, did he, did he have a pen and paper, um, you know, describing his own crucifixion as he was going through it or his own resurrection, <laughs> which is kind of funny because it's the same problem that, that people have when they say that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, you know, because they, they have to say that he comes back to life in order to write the last bit of it, which is his own death. Um, you know, we, and none of us, which is a great reminder, you know, even if we're writing our own autobiography, none of us can really write the full story because our, I mean, I, we would have to be resurrected to come back to, to write the full story. Turns out, I mean, Jesus was resurrected. So theoretically, yes, he could have written the last part of the gospel. But the, what the Marcionite writer, um, writers do, or, or the Marcionite dialoguers in the Adamantrius, what they do is they say, well, Paul wrote the last bit about Jesus's resurrection. So, <laughs> so, so they get around that question. But it, it, it raises the historical question of, you know, why didn't, you know, if, if Marcion himself actually commented on this issue, what he said is has been lost. OK, so we don't know if 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 these guys are being faithful to Marcion or not. Maybe they are. Maybe they're not. We just don't we just don't know. Um, is there a mention of the prototype gospel before Marcion? Well, I mean, nobody gets up and says I'm using the prototype gospel. But but we do have. Um, Vasilides writes a book called the Exegetica, and it's it, it's based on a version of Luke. Okay, he mentions this parable between the rich man and Lazarus, and, and that's distinctively, uh, it's distinctively Lucan. It's distinctively proto-Lucan, however you want to want to say it. We also have the Gospel of Thomas. Something that I was interested in, which I'm doing a little bit for this book on Marcion, is I'm I'm going through the Gospel of Thomas which is early second century and uh, first half, and I think, and, and I'm going through all the, all the passages where it mentions Luke 
and I'm checking to see if it's also in Marcion. And I can confirm to you that um, there's not a single passage in the Gospel of Thomas, in my view, that is connected necessarily to canonical Luke, okay? There are some bits in, um, in the Gospel of Thomas where it's unattested for Marcion, so we don't know if he had a passage or not, right? Um, so, you know, we can't make a decision. But I think what's going on is that people like Vasilides and the author of, the, of, of, of Thomas and perhaps several others, maybe uh, the author of Second Clement and the... Uh, and even Justin Martyr, you know, Andrew Gregory says he, even Justin Martyr never actually refers to a gospel according to anybody. He just refers to gospel traditions. So he could very well be um, using the prototype gospel and just not telling you that he's using the prototype gospel because it doesn't yet have a name. It's not yet called according to Luke because it isn't according to Luke. That's a later revision. Even, you know, it's going on as Justin is literally you know, staying in his apartment above the baths of Martinus, you know, but, but <laughs> you know, somewhere in Rome, probably someone is editing, <laughs> you know, the prototype gospel to make it into what we know is canonical Luke. And Justin, you know, really has no idea. <laughs> um, all that he refers to is things like, you know, the, the, the memorabilia, you know, the, the memoirs of the apostles. Okay. That's how he refers to the gospels. So absolutely, could he be using the prototype gospel? Absolutely, he could. And then you ask, well, how does he then know about the virgin birth? Well, Andrew Gregory, who's a great scholar in the UK, you know, this is not me, this is Andrew Gregory. Andrew Gregory says that it's very possible that he knows these virgin birth traditions just literally from independent stories, the very same stories that the author of Canonical Luke is using to build Luke, okay, which is interesting and an exciting theory, right? Um, that, so we, we can't assume that he's using canonical Luke. <laughs> I mean, we just can't assume that. I mean, he never, ever calls it according to Luke. So, you know, keep that, keep that in mind. And then does the prototype use any of the earlier Gospels? Well, this is the big question, right? And, and how would we determine it? Because, as I said, earlier, you know, these are such fluid pro products, you know, I, I mean, essentially the, the tough answer is, and, and the unfortunate answer is it, it's, it's kind of unanswerable because they're so fluid. Um, if these were, if these were not moving targets, maybe we could say, well, um, you know, he, he, you know, Mark is borrowing from proto the prototype gospel or the prototype gospel is borrowing from Mark. But um, they're both in flux. They're literally both in flux. Their texts, their very texts are unstable. And they are, you know, that way until well into the, the late second century. So, you know, that makes it, it extremely and difficult, difficult. I think the only way we could really fully answer is if we had either an autograph, which is the original copy, or you know that the, the the gospel writer wrote on, or first late first century copies of these texts, or early second century, and we the, you know the interesting thing about Mark is we don't even have manuscripts of Mark until the the early third century. Wow, I mean that's that's incredible. Um, okay, um, I really appreciate this other. Uh, super chat question from uh, Mr. Silva here. Thank you for being a member. Really appreciate that. Um, what do you think about the challenges against the consensus that the Gospels were written in Greek? There seems to be many Hebraisms in, in Matthew and Luke. Well, I think one of the reasons that you get what might be called Semitisms or, or Hebraisms is because they're imitating the language of the Septuagint. And the Septuagint is definitely trans, it, it's definitely what we would call um, translation Greek. Okay. So, well, I shouldn't say it all, you know, actually um, there are portions of the Septuagint that are written directly in, in Greek. Um, for instance, the Wisdom of Solomon. Um, what, what, comes across as, as apocryphal literature in Roman Catholic texts or deuterocanonical literature. 
books like Tobit and, and Judith, um, these seem to be written originally in Greek. So, but the vast majority of the Septuagint is translation Greek, meaning it's taken from a Hebrew or Aramaic text and it's put into Greek. And we can even date when that happens in the case of the wisdom of, of Ben Sira or Sirach, he, you know, you know, the, the Sira's, Ben Sira's grandson writes in his preface and he's saying, I'm translating my grandfather's book and uh, here I am, I'm, I'm in Egypt. And so we can actually locate him when he's doing that. So when you have translation Greek, and in fact, when you have translation in any, in any language, there's an attempt to kind of render things in a different way than what you would render them as a native speaker. So it's absolutely the case that when certainly Matthew, and especially the author of Canonical Luke, and we see this in the birth narratives of Luke, he's definitely trying his hardest to read like the Septuagint. And he, he's literally got the cadence of the Septuagint down. You know, it's, it's kind of like when, if you read any Nietzsche, you know, in, in Thus Spake Zarathustra, you know, there's, there's passages where he's imitating the cadence of like the, the old German Bible, you know. <laughs> um, and, you know, people do this today with the, the King James Version, you know, when they're trying to, you know, sound cute or funny or, or cheeky. And, uh, you know, para adventure, I'll go to the grocery store, you know, or, um, you know, like using our old archaic language, but language which you would recognize as biblical, you know, thus says the Lord and, you know, Jesus spake unto him, you know, I mean, <laughs> you automatically know this is from the Bible. So um, this is what Luke, the author of Canonical Luke, was trying to do in, in the birth narratives. And that's why many, many readers think, you know, the birth narratives are written later or they're written at some other time. In fact, even good, you know, staunchly Roman Catholic scholars, commentators like Joseph Fitzmaier uh, and uh, Ray Brown, you know, they, they agreed that actually the original version of Luke uh, started at chapter 3, verse 1, which is where Marcin's text starts. And that the, the, birth, the, the birth narratives, which sounded like they were out of like the book of 2 Samuel, I mean, they literally sound like 1st or 2nd Samuel, but that's by intention. You know, all, all those Semitisms, you know, I, I don't think the author of Canonical Luke or the author of the Prototype Gospel is, is, a, um, is a native Hebrew speaker. I, I think that they're trying to imitate the translation Greek of the Septuagint in order to sound like the Septuagint, because for them, Right. That's the Bible. So they want to sound if they're going to write something that's biblical, if they're going to write something that is designed to accrue authority, then they want to sound like the Bible. Right. Just as if I'm going to forge a text like the Gospel of Jesus Wife or Secret Mark, I want to sound like the Bible. Right. I'm, I mean, I'm not, I, <laughs> you know, this isn't rocket science. So, you know, you write in this kind of biblical way, you know. You know. I, OK. I hope that clears things up. I, I, I definitely, I, I, I think any theory that, that says that these texts were not written in, in Greek, um, that that's, that's, that's not, not well supported. Um, I mean, of course, anything's possible, but that, that's very unlikely. Uh, Welsh backgammon, thank you so much uh, for your super sticker. Really appreciate it. Uh, Mercurius Aulicus, love the name. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, Okay, so um, we've got uh, a couple more uh, Super Chats. I really appreciate that, guys um, and gals here. Uh, so let me see if I can pronounce this. Uh, Kefitzat Mashiach, um, thank you so much for your Super Chat. Is Pseudo-Clementine's uh, story of how Simon took over from Decythius accurate? What do you think of the theory uh, all four with Jesus knew each other and, and were friends. Um, that would be lovely, right? I mean, <laughs> now that would be just the story that would make a great novel. And that's exactly what the Pseudo-Clementines is, right? So when you get, when you get the book, and I hope you can get the book and if you, and you know, I'll give you a deal, you know, I'll give you a deal. Um, join Patreon or message me. I'll get you the book cheaper. Um, 
basically what we've got here in the pseudo-Clementines is, is a novel. Now, people want to push that early and want to say that the Grunschrift or the, you know, the basic writing of this novel is in the third century. And that's true, but we just, we don't have any manuscripts of the, of, of the Grunschrift. All we got are these fourth century novels. And so if you turn to the last chapter of my book, I go all through the pseudo-Clementines, okay? It is the greatest story of all. I mean, there's no doubt about it in terms of its literary value, in terms of its, in terms of, uh, it, it, it's a page turner. This whole idea of, of, of Dositheus, the battle between Dositheus and Simon, you know, the, the very idea that Simon and Dositheus were followers of John the Baptist, that's cool, you know, and the, and the reason why Simon lost his chance to lead the group when, when John the Baptist died you know, he was in Egypt learning magic. Wow, cool. Wow. And so he gets back and Dositheus is in charge now. And, uh, you know, and, and, and then they do this magic trick where Simon poses as the standing one and Dositheus beats him with the rod of Moses and the rod goes right through his body. I mean, this stuff is really, really cool. Is there anything accurate? I mean, in the sense of historically accurate about these stories, I don't think so. And, and you know, that's, but that's really like, what I would recommend to everybody is just enjoy the story, right? Like these, like if, if you're gonna read a historical novel today or just a novel, I mean, but a novel trying to sound like history, right? You're just gonna enjoy the novel. You're not gonna get bogged down by, oh my, you know, is this true, you know, I, I, or, or did this actually happen? I, I mean, that, that, that'll slow you down. <laughs> So I think the, you know, the author of the Pseudo-Clementines is really doing the same thing. He's an orthodox, he, well, no, he's not. <laughs> I caught myself. He's not at all orthodox. But he's an author who's, who uh, is obviously trying to deconstruct Simon and to destroy Simon and Simonian influence. And he's trying to you know, attack a variety of enemies, including Paul. You know, I'm not denying that, he, that Paul is an enemy, but he... We've also got, you know, philosophers who are also the enemies of this of this figure. And and Simon, you know, uh, does duty for philosophers, does duty for intellectuals, does duty for astrologers, does duty for uh, Paulinists, does does duty for a whole number of figures that the author of the pseudo Clementines is trying to take down and deconstruct. Okay, absolutely the case. Now, I mean, you could get someone who's like, well, you know. You know, we want this to be true. So maybe that you know there was an oral memory, an oral tradition that was just you know faintly remembered and passed on, and and maybe they you know John the Baptist and Jesus and Simon and and Dositheus, maybe they were all in the same group, and maybe they all got the same secret esoteric lore, and that no doubt would be cool. And and you know that's like the. Uh, the perennialist's wet dream, right? You know, I mean, I, and I, I don't do that to be sound insulting. I mean, I, I think that this would be the coolest thing ever if you could actually prove it. But we just don't do history from novels. At least I don't. I, I, <laughs> I mean, you, you, otherwise, you know, we really just kind of submit to wishful thinking and speculation. Now, you know, I, I'm also of the attitude that, you know, I, I'm not a stickler about these things. I really am of the attitude, that, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. You know, if, if you want to write a novel or you want to write a history, you know, saying that, you know, Dositheus, John the Baptist, Jesus, and, you know, that, that, that they were all in the same group uh, of the same mindset. And they all originally together, you know, best bros, you know, go for it. Find the evidence. Hopefully you'll find it outside the pseudo-Clementines because you're going to need something to support that outside of the novel. But thank you so much for your question, uh, uh, Zat. I'm going to go to John D. Thank you again so much. Uh, nice to have you back, John. So appreciate the super chat. What do you make of, of the Hebrew Bible proofs in Gospel of John and Paul from the perspective that Jesus is God, isn't Yahweh, if you think this might be the case? Well, you know... Just, ever since the days of Justin Martyr, right, and so mid-2nd century, not at the very beginning, but mid-2nd century, Christians really got this bright idea that the way they could support their religion, the truth of their religion, is to say that it had a prophetic fulfillment, right? So, so this argument never works today. Like, I mean, it, well, I, I suppose in very conservative fundamentalist circles, people are still arguing this, that, that you know, 
Jesus is Jesus is true, uh, or, or the, the religion of Christianity is true because it, Jesus fulfills prophecy. Okay. Um, in the second century, that argument was big, right? Because it was one of the ways that you know, even philosophers like Porphyry they believed in oracles. You know, Porphyry writes a book called you know Philosophy from Oracles. So they believed in oracles. They believe in prophecies from other gods. And, and pretty much everybody believed that. I mean, unless you were an atheist, and the atheists in the in antiquity are extremely few. I mean, real, genuine atheists. So that's one way they could connect with, the, with their audience. So, be, uh, you know, in, the, in antiquity, you had these books of oracles, you know, from Orpheus. You had books of oracles from, uh, you know, the, the, the Chaldean oracles, which, which you know, are, survive in fragments today. Great, great book to read, okay, by the way. Um, You've got oracle sounding stuff in the Hermetica. You've got books of oracles. Uh, you've got the Sibylline oracles, which are, are actually, you know, the closest thing to the Roman Bible or is the Sibylline oracles. I mean, they literally have the Sibylline oracles. They consult the Sibylline oracles every time that there's some kind of disaster in the state. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, everybody believes in prophetic oracles. And so what Christians do is they got, they, they finally get this bright idea in the second century that, my God, we've got this whole book of oracles. You know, we call it the, the Jewish prophets, but but we can sell this as a book of oracles, and we can try to connect this with Jesus to prove the truth of Jesus' story. Now, there's something slightly perverse about the argument because, as so many people, you know, uh, have pointed out, and, and you know, it, it's it's almost banal, but the gospel writers knew the Hebrew Bible. There's no doubt about that. Okay. And they had these paradigms in their minds, you know, about the stories of Samuel and the stories of David and the stories of Moses. And they wrote their gospels with these paradigms in mind. And then generation later, or maybe not so long, you know, maybe just 20 years later, Justin is like, oh my God, you know, this story of Jesus sounds like Moses, you know? <laughs> well, of course it sounds like Moses. You know? you know, this whole story of Herod killing the young in, in, in Bethlehem, you know, it, it, it sounds like Moses, right? Who, you know, and, and who was almost killed, you know, because the boys were thrown into the River Nile. And it sounds like Moses because... Effectively, it is Moses. I mean, the, the gospel writers were writing that were writing these stories with Moses in mind. Okay, so absolutely, they could then go back, and you know, Isaiah was was one of the very favorite texts that that Christians used and exploited, and we and we see that in Paul and and but Justin's unique because then he starts you know doing you know, turning up the dial on typology, you know, looking at texts which actually aren't prophetic and then saying that, oh, they actually do fulfill types and they, you know, they actually are prophetic because they point to Jesus. Anyway, getting to your question, you know, which which raises the question, you know, for Marcin, because Marcin has this this stuff as well. It's not, you know, you'll hear, um, you know, in, in the Wikipedia version of Marcin or the, the Adolf von Harnack version of Marcin, um, or the kind of conservative evangelical version of Marcion, that Marcion is this great theological editor who goes in there with a scissors and cuts out every single Hebrew Bible prophecy and every single reference to Hebrew Bible figures. It's absolute baloney. It's absolute baloney. And it, you know, Transfiguration is a case in point. Moses and Elijah are still there in, in, in Marcion's text. The story of Lazarus and the rich man, Abraham's bosom, a Abraham and his bosom are still there, you know. Um, the prophetic texts are still cited. They're not cited as thus says the Lord, but or this was to fulfill, you know, what was said in the prophet. That's Matthew's, you know, improvement, uh, depending on your perspective. He's going to let you know his is a Hebrew Bible text, whereas Marcin is going to have a text which cites scripture every once in a while, but he's not going to like parade it out there, you know. And of course, there are plenty of illusions. So, you know, then it raises the question, well, how did Marcion actually think that, you know, the true God and, and, and Yahweh are actually different because Yahweh is the one speaking the prophecies and Jesus 
does refer to the creator and does and does things and he does go to you know the Jewish synagogue. So how does all of this happen? You know, how, how does Marcion think of this? Well, the short answer is that he thinks of this in a fundamentally different way than Justin did. He doesn't buy the typology. He doesn't think that, Je that Jesus fulfills Old Testament types. He thinks that, that Jesus comes to Judea specifically in order to, essentially, it, it, it's like God sends Jesus to the most religious place on earth in order to help the people who are most imprisoned by the ideology of their own minds. You know, the religion of the creator, the, the, the religion of the violent tribalistic God, the religion which is the most atrocious and the most genocidal in its potential, that's where the, the, the father sends the son, right? It's not because the father has an essential connection to Judaism. It's because he sends Jesus there because that's where he was most needed. Jesus doesn't go to synagogue because he's trying to connect with Moses. Jesus goes to, to the synagogues and teaches because he's trying to deliver people from the strictures of the creator's law. And he's going to the place where the creator has the most brutal control and tyranny. So anyway, a lot can be said about this, but um, I, I think I'll, um, <laughs> I, I, I think I'll, I, I have to have to get to, to, to Ali Rowan here. Um, uh, Ali, I really appreciate your, uh, your super chat. And uh, so we've got, I, I haven't seen this abbreviation, Irene, or, or Irenaeus and the Refutator both quote from, Simon's own teaching, which justifies libertinism and lawbreaking and a sexual ritual being necessary for salvation, were they misrepresenting Simon? Well, I'm not sure, you know, because that's the great black hole, right? Like my book is to say to people, what do we know about Simon? Not much. I mean, not much at all, right? I mean, it's, I would say that a lot of it is is complete misrepresentation, right? The earliest data we have about Simon is, is you know, 50, 80, 80 years after his death. I mean, they, the stories of Simon really take off a full century after his death, right? Stories of him in Helen, stories of, of him having a statue in Rome. And then, you know, by the late second century, he's this full-blown um, demonic magician that can do these magic tricks and you know perform half resurrections and he, he ends up flying to heaven and peter knocks him down with a prayer i mean all, all this stuff is is late second century okay so and irenaeus and the, and the refutator i mean the refutators are the third century so so the stories that they know about simon are are, are what i would call these ecclesial yellow journalism or, or you know, the, the, the early Catholic takedowns, apocryphal takedowns of Simon. That's the stuff that they know best, right? It begins with the author of Acts, but, you know, the author of Acts, I think, is writing around 140, 150 anyway. So, I mean, it's not like he's original. You know, what we find in Acts 8 is just as apocryphal as anything we find in the Acts of Peter and really, probably, I mean, it's not qualitatively much better than what we find in the pseudo-Plementine. So could Simon have been a libertine? Absolutely, he could have been. We just need evidence, and we just need good evidence about Simon. So then the next question is, what, what my book is really about, is about it's, it's about the Simonians. It's about the actual followers of Simon who, 100 years after his death, 70 years after his death, 80 years after his death, said, yeah, Simon was a cool guy, and he's our dude, so... What were they saying? And that's where I point people to the, the Great Declaration. Now, it's true that the refutator passes on the Great Declaration, often with kind of snide comments, you know, intervening. But actually, the Great Declaration is our, our I think, I mean, I'm, I'm proposing it in the book. It's sort of my grand thesis, you know, what, what they'll know me for when I croak, you know, is, is that the Great Declaration is our first and most reliable Simonian source. So if we want to learn about Simonians, we go there.
first. So that's the argument. And then I say also, you know, you can also take a peek at the concept of the great power, which is in, in Nagamati Code X6, which seems to have some distinctly Simonian lore. But if we focus on the great declaration, we don't find really much about ethics at all. So we, again, we can't really say whether they were libertine or non or ascetic or something in between, because the picture of Simon that we get in, in the great declaration, presumably of Simonians, is it's kind of like the intellectuals version of Simon. You know, it's kind of like Simon, the super sage, Simon, the philosopher, who's talking about, you know, like the stoic creative fire. And he's talking about, he's allegorizing, he produces the first hexameron, which is an allegory of the, of the first six days in Genesis. And he's got interesting theories about the meaning of heaven and earth. And he's got allegories at the wazoo. And he's, he's just this really kind of amazing biblical interpreter. And so, you know, we can then ask, well, in Justin Martyr's time, were there Simonians who were uh, libertine, possibly, but the only thing that Justin has are these rumors, which are really spread against all Christians. And the most famous rumor is, you know, the, the, <laughs> I, I, I love, I don't know how this story got created. I, I think whoever made this story was an absolute genius. Though, that, and, and I'm not even sure if, if it was first told about Christians, it, it might be told about other groups as well, but basically, you know, men and women would get together in a room at night and there'd be, uh, you know, one candle lit or one lamp lit in the middle of the room and they'd have a dog tied to the, the stool, basically, uh, where they put this lamp. And um, they would have an old piece of meat or a bone and they'd, they'd at, at the end of their ceremony, or I, I don't know, you know, maybe at the beginning, who knows, but they would throw the, throw the, the bone and the dog would, run after the bone, but the dog's leash was tied to the stool. So he would pull out the stool and the lamp would go out. And then everybody would apparently just start making out with whoever they encountered in the dark. And uh, Justin's got this line where he says, you know, I don't know if the story is true, but <laughs> if it is true, it's not us. It's these guys. <laughs> so, I, I mean, you know, it, this is interesting. This is the kind of like... Um, satanic rumors we we that are kind of like what you would hear like in, in the late 80s i mean i guess it's still going on today where like uh you know the democrats are eating babies and then the kind of that kind of stuff um i don't put a whole lot of stock into it just because justin himself doesn't put a whole lot of stock into it um so yeah but you know it, it again it, it's not to it's not to deny that you know people like the simonians were free thinkers it's not to deny that in their ethics they weren't legalists or they, they didn't believe in heteronomy. You know, I, I think that there are things about their ethical life that you can glean from the texts that are left behind, right? And but but you you've got to go, you've got to be absolutely critical and and sift and sift and sift and sift and see if any of this stuff is verified. Um, you know, it's it's like. Uh, the best kind of thing that you could do, I think, in this kind of study is as you're studying heresiology, you're studying, you know, conspiracy theories, basically, um, because heresiology and conspiracy theories, uh, conspiracy writing are actually really, really similar. <laughs> um, I mean, they, they really, I mean, you can think of heresiology as a form of conspiracy theory writing. Um, they're not out there to be uh, accurate. Every once in a while, I think, I mean, I don't think that they're deliberately lying, but, it, and so every once in a while, you can pick up something that, that is, uh, that is really worth historical investigation, but that's, um, that comes with years and years and years of experience in this literature. And you've got to be reading in the original languages and you've got to know the tendencies of these writers and absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, appreciate your question. Um, I'm going to take one more. <laughs> this hour just flew by. Thank you so much for everybody coming along. Um, we're back again with uh, Kefitza Mashiach. Really appreciate, again, the, the, the super chat. And um, so we've got, it's so poetic. Samaritism was the twin brother of Judaism that there was a parallel Samaritan version of Christianity like it was to Judaism. Yeah. Well, that's very fascinating, you know, and, and what, the way uh, the way that I would kind of tweak this is to say that 
you know, there was a reason, one of the, maybe the, maybe the only, I mean, sure fact about Simon that we can maybe glean from the author of Acts is that he hung around Samaria. Now, it, for whatever reason, which I can't quite figure out, is scholars, you know, since like the 19, uh, early 1900s and even before, because Simon hung around Samaria, they've all kind of assumed that he was a Samaritan, that is a follower of the worship, a follower of, of the Samaritan religion, right? So, which is a kind of Yahwistic religion where they have a form of Yahweh, they have a form of their own Torah, there's a Samaritan Pentateuch, they've got their own script, they've got their own rituals. They are, yeah, they're siblings to to the the Jews, right? Uh, but but they don't they don't really get along, and they've got this bad past, you know, and. It turns out that one of the Maccabean rulers, you know, uh, burnt the Samaritan temple and it caused all this bad blood. You know, everybody's so fixated on the burning of the Jewish temple in 70, they forget that the Jews, you know, 115 years before this, burned the Samaritan temple. On, on, uh, so at any rate, um, I think what's interesting about this is, I think, or at least I propose in the book that What's going on here is there is a Sumerian form of Christianity going on. And, and it's, it doesn't very much look like the Jerusalem variety, right? So, you know, the author of Acts is big on Jerusalem, you know, that that's kind of like the central headquarters of early Christianity, even though there was no such thing as a central headquarters. But, you know, he really wanted to have that uh, as, as kind of like the central place. And then he's got this line and then Acts, I think it's X 1 8, you know, where the gospel spreads from Jerusalem to Samaria to the ends of the world. And, and so Samaria is very important. And I think what the author of Acts does is he's got the story of Simon in Samaria leading a Christian group there, but it's not the kind of Christianity that the author of Acts likes. It's a Samarian Christianity. It's not a Samaritan Christianity. Okay. <laughs> It, it, I mean, it, it's, it's like an American Christianity, right? That, because it's a Christianity in America. So Simon is a Sumerian apostle. He's, he's not Samaritan. He's a Christian. And so what happens is the author of X is like, I don't like that. And so he, ha he invents probably a story in which John and Peter go to Samaria and they Jerusalemize or or. <laughs> um, I, I was going to say Judaize. I mean, I, I guess maybe in some respects that's correct, but they they uh, orthodoxify um, Samaria, if I can coin that word, and that means that they need to get rid of Simon. And so, the author of of, of Acts has the story where Simon ends up just like groveling before Peter, <laughs> which is has to be like. You know, it, it's interestingly, it's not a total takedown of Simon, but it but it it, it does make him look basically like an idiot, um, and so that's interesting. Um, but but yeah, I, I mean, I think the best that a historian can do through guesswork is to say that there was truly a Sumerian version of Christianity. There were, you know, maybe Sumerian apostles. Maybe Simon was one of them. But these Jerusalem apostles, they didn't have any clout in Samaria. You know, they. They did not have the kind of authority that they are often given in church history. Church history in the first century is like church history in the 21st century. Christians think different things and they're in different areas and they've got different versions of their religion and they all think that they're right, right? <laughs> so, and anyway, yes, but, you know, history goes to those who, who actually write in the sense of W-R-I-T-E. And so the author of Acts gets his version in there. So that, my friends, is the end of the hour. I just want to thank everybody, uh, especially I, I see that a lot of you put, put stuff in the chat. I'm going to read every one of your chats here. Uh, but for the moment, and, and I know, you know, Ali, I see your chats. I, I know there's, there's, there's very specific wording that we have to pay attention to. Absolutely. And... I hope you're able to read the book. I hope all of you were able to read the book and, and look at my very specific, detailed, concrete arguments. Uh, so I, I can only speak sort of on a general level here. 
unfortunately, I can't give you footnotes either, but uh, it is what it is. You know, this is YouTube and it's just an introduction for your deeper study. So I hope you're able to do that. I know the book is totally overpriced. You know, I mean, you may want to wait till the paperback version comes out. That's totally fine. But again, on Patreon, I've got this 35% off code, which you can access. Check that out. Uh, check out my new blog, mdavidlitwood.com. Um, got some interesting stuff there on uh, now on the Marcy Knight Church. And uh, I've got four or five blog posts there. I've talked about Canon, recent developments in Canon, Marcion and Canon. And I talk about several other things which I've been researching uh, to, through a bunch of German articles that I've been reading. Anyway, I'm trying to make this material accessible, so check it out. Thanks, everybody, for coming along. You've really made this Sunday special for me, and this is a wonderful, fun tradition that I have. I just want to thank all of you for making that possible and for helping me uh, support myself. And finally, hopefully someday, uh, be free from the academic system, become my own university. Thank you so much uh, to everybody and take care.